we can let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for your Sabbath day where we can come apart from the world, Lord, and spend time together with fellow believers and with you and your angels as you partake here together with us today. We would ask that your Holy Spirit would be present today, Lord, to guide my lips as I speak, Lord, that your words may be heard and not mine. God bless everything that is done here today. In Jesus' wonderful name, we ask this. Amen. Are you able to hear me okay? I got these new hearing aids, and I keep getting echoes in my, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Is that me talking? Yeah. So we're talking about Lot's wife this morning here. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That is probably the most dramatic, potent illustration the master ever used in a sermon. As we read the context, it is very obvious that the words were being applied to those living on this planet right now. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke. And we're going to be looking at chapter 17, verses 28 to 32. That's Luke 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke. It was here yesterday. Oh, yeah. Seventeen and verses twenty-eight through thirty-two. Likewise, I also, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. What did Jesus mean by that cryptic expression, remember Lot's wife? What does that woman of long ago have to do with people who are living here near the end of time? Why did the master relate Mrs. Lot to our day? Jesus used her as a fearful warning. That woman became cold, careless, and disobedient. Finally, the judgments of God fell upon her, and she became a pillar of salt on the plains of Sodom. I gather that one of the most deadly perils for God's people in the last days will be to slowly slip away from the truth, as Mrs. Lot did. Jesus warned that the loss of spiritual power takes place almost imperceptibly. In Matthew 24, 12, he states, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. As pressures of conformity and compromise crowd in, the faith gradually erodes and disappears. How can we explain this slacking of spiritual power? How does the devil steal the very heart out of the Christian experience one thing is certain, it does not happen overnight. People lose their love for the truth by degrees. Little by little, they lower standards and compromise the faith until nothing remains except a dead formalism. When we read all that Jesus said about those who are saved, we see one grand absolute truth standing out clearly. 
There will be no divided heart in heaven. There will be no half surrender on the part of the redeemed. Those who enter into God's kingdom will be there because they wanted eternal life more than anything else in the world. The Lord Jesus used Lot's wife as an example for those in the last days who will not be single-minded for the truth, who will love material things more than the things of God. In Luke 14, 33, Jesus says, So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Have you done that yet? Have you forsaken all? But let's get back to the story of Light's, Lot's wife and try to understand what Jesus wants us to learn from her example. According to the Bible record, she belonged to one of the finest families in the East. As a nephew of Abraham, Lot shared the tremendous faith of his uncle and prayed at Abraham's altar. When God's call came to get out of Mesopotamia, Lot went right along with Abraham, not knowing where the call might lead. Together they brought their families into the to the ever entering place of the promised land and offered their sacrifices of thanksgiving. Well, after a while, dissension erupted between the herdsmen of the two wealthy kinsmen. We all know this story. Their vast combined flocks and herds didn't have enough room to graze in such a restricted area, and they had to separate. Abraham, being the nice guy that he was, gave Lot first choice. Lot was given the choice of direction as the whole land stretched out before him. On one side laid the vervent hills with their lofty trees. The other led down into the valley. Crowded centers there of commerce and trade. The materialistic appeal of the prosperous cities had an immediate impact on Lot. And the Bible records very simply in Genesis 13, 12, that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. The predictable pattern of future tragedy was settled by that early decision to move near those wicked cities. Lot stands forth as a man of good intentions. Quite obviously, he did not actually plan to take his family into the environment of sinful Sodom. He would only live in the vicinity where he could take advantage of the economic opportunities of such a bustling capital. Very likewise, he made special mental, mental reservations about letting his fam family mingle with degraded inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. He had no idea at all of giving up his religion. His move was promptest, prompted by selfish concern over temporal advantages. And he had no intention of losing anything. But what happened in spite of all the wonderful intentions? Well, poor Lot lost his wife, his possessions, and almost his own life. Good intentions were not good enough. He moved closer and closer to the cities until finally, he actually moved in to dwell with the Sodomites. His plans to guard the spiritual interests of his children failed to materialize. All his rationalization about counteracting the wickedness with strict, stricter prayer schedules and family altar religion just didn't seem to work out as planned. He gradually compromised with the environment and watched his children slowly assimilate the ways of their heathen 
neighbors. I'm sure Lot did not feel at ease when he first settled among the evil citizens of the, that abominable place. Every day he heard news of the mushrooming crime rate. He must have re been repulsed and even horrified by the vile jokes and obscene language. Then he had to watch with alarm the growing fascination of his family for the perverted lifestyle of their friends and associates. Does this sound like anything going on today in the world? We're seeing Sodom and Gomorrah today, aren't we? Finally, his daughters fell in love with worldly men and married them. Outside of the home, united with the enemies of God, they lost all faith in the ancestral religion of their childhood and youth. <clears throat> they began to look upon Lot as narrow and bigoted and soon expressed their extreme loathing of his half-hearted appeals to establish true worship in their homes. Sad situation. Nevertheless, we still tend to sympathize with Lot in his frustrated attempts to hold the reins on his unregenerate wife and children. He had much against them, but most of it had been created by his own weakness and indecision. One compromise led to another until finally he must have been he must have become totally demoralized over the rebellion of his worldly family. Still, it was an act of flagrant presumption when Lot actually settled within the city. The society there was shameless, degenerate, and entirely sex perverted. Mrs. Lot um, not only moved into Sodom, that Sodom moved into her. She was a type who loved fine things and the mad whirl of social excitement of party rounds of pleasure. And the evidence seems to indicate that she eventually shared much of the materialistic mindset of the Sodomites. How could this happen to the wife of Abraham's relative? What brought this terrible soul ruin to this woman? Was it because she believed the call of, believed, disbelieved the call of God to get out? No, she did not mock the message. Did her married daughters and their husbands? She believed the warning and actually started on her way to safety. But mark this, there was no eagerness in her heart and no enthusiasm for the program. She was so reluctant to lead the fine appointments of her affluent Sodom home that she lingered. Her heart and life had been so bound to material things that she could hardly pull away from the accumulated treasures of those finely finished rooms. With death at her heels, she lingered with life and security awaiting her on the mountaintop, she lingered. With life, when, what was wrong with the woman? The problem was that she loved the world more than she loved God. I hope none of us are there. The Lord is coming soon. Now is not the time to leave. She still believed the truth. She knew what she ought to do. She wanted to be saved, yet she lingered. Today, we still find many people exactly like Mrs. Lott. They also believe the truth, know what they ought to do, and want to be saved. They linger too, just as she did. 
Like Lot's wife, many of them wait until the pull of the world overpowers the will to act. And they are not able to let go of things. Why will people linger over the call of God? Have you ever done it? Millions have lingered until the best years of their life are gone. They linger until the children grow up and are lost in the world. They linger until the world holds them with bands of steel and the voice of God dimly fades away. But at last, Mrs. Lot began to move. The record describes how angels had to take hold of their hands to hurry them out of the doomed city. The angels cried, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. But Lot's wife did not reach the safety of the mountains. Why? The Bible says, Bible tells us that she looked back and immediately became a pillar of salt. Why did God deal with her so severely? Was it not the smallest offense of all just to move the head slightly? The word of God has a name of that type of action. Sin. She disobeyed the commandment of God. And her judgment underlines the urgency of obedience. God means what he says. There is no excuse for sin, and God cannot overlook it. No wonder then that Lot's wife suffered the same terrible consequences of all others who trifled with the word of a holy God. The offense of looking back indicated a divided will. Two voices were competing for her allegiance. One, the voice of the highlands, the voice of calling her to liberty, purity, and salvation. The other, the voice of the lowlands, the voice of popularity and pleasure, the voice of Sodom. Slowly, the voice from beneath gained the mastery of a badly bent conscience, and Mrs. Lott stands before us as a tragic example of a divided heart. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, and he said it to those who had lived through the final traumatic moments of earth's history. He's saying it to us right now. Remember Lot's wife. We need that message. Millions are just as double-minded as Mrs. Lot. They find no time to pray with their family. Many read magazines, watch TV, or the computers more than the Bible. And thus they have only a superficial form of religion. Like Mrs. Lot, they linger around the edges of sin and make no strong decision to go all the way in obedience to God. Some, like Lot's wife, will be so wedded to the world that they cannot let go in time. They will have to perish with the things they loved. Others, like Lot, will arouse just in time to choose quickly and decisively. Without a backward glance, they will move out in complete obedience to the will of God. The same issues that precipitated the dramatic showdown in Sodom are leavening the Christian church at almost every level. Materialism, and lukewarmness have placed a mold upon the lifestyle of millions who profess to be followers of truth today. While the winds of destruction are slowly slipping through the fingers of the four angels who have been holding them back, 
the professed people of God relax in a carnally secure dream world. Like Lot's family, they have become comfortable in the society of money markets and a compromised faith. The story of Lot and his family proves that God will not long tolerate a life style, a double lifestyle on the part of his professed people. Those who are trying to live in two, two worlds must make a decision. In James 4, 4, it says, whoever so therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Pretty strong words. John, 1 John 2.15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus knew that many others would be just as attached to things as Lot's wife was. They would linger, then look back with longing heart upon those things that are forbidden. In Luke 14, 33, Jesus said, Whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Are you ready to give it all up? What's holding us back here? Is there anything here that we really are that attached to? The word of God has much to say about sin, but never a good word. No one has ever read the slightest inspired mention that sin should be reduced or diminished. Whenever it is mentioned, sin is declared to be non-negotiable. It is to be abandoned, rejected, and utterly reputed. Jesus does not say to the adulterous woman, go and taper off on the sin. He said, go and sin no more. John did not write, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin less and less. He plainly said, I write unto you that you sin not. Just as the angels pleaded with Lot and his family to make a total surrender, the Holy Spirit urges upon us the same kind of commitment today. Multitudes linger in the twilight zone of indecision while the fires of destruction are poised for the annihilation of this world. Worldlings and professed Christians alike are hearing the plea of God to turn away from the Sodom in their lives. The door of probation is open for only a few minutes more. The sins of Sodom are just as hypnotizing and appealing today as they were long ago. The same perverse practices have been more commonplace and popular than they ever were in the doomed city of the plains. You know, if, have, we, have you looked around here lately, folks, at the news and the garbage that's coming out from Hollywood and, and the programs? I mean, if the Lord doesn't come soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for destroying them. We're, we're right here on the end. The only thing he's waiting on is us and us to share this good news with others. The secret of being able to resist and reject the appeal of a perverse, renegade society is to look at the cross of Jesus. We might abhor the evil and desire deliverance, but there is only one source of strength to break the pattern of sin. Christ's substitu substitutionary death at Calvary satisfied the penalty which transgression had placed against every living soul in the world. 
The broken law demanded death. And when Jesus suffered that penalty for every man and woman on the cross, a glorious transaction was made. I loved a statement made on page 83 of the Desire of Ages. Most of you are familiar with it, but I'd like to read it to you one more time. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene. Have you done that lately? Especially those closing ones. I give out a lot of desire of ages to people. I say, if you don't read any of the book, it's a big book. Turn to Gethsemane. Read that chapter and you won't be able to put the rest of the book down. Read Gethsemane. See what Jesus went through for you and for me. Another section of the Desire of Ages, pages 713 and 714, Peter was outside. He wasn't next. John was up next to Jesus at this time. Where was Peter? He was out with a mixed multitude by a fire warming himself. And he had denied the, the Lord three times with these folks. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the, crock, of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked upon his poor disciple. Can you get the scene? Jesus was getting hammered on by the Sadducees and the Pharisees there. He took time away from that. He knew what was happening. He knows what's happening with you today, folks. He knew what was happening to Peter, and he looked over at him. Looked over at him. And at the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to him. In that gentle countenance, Peter read deep pity and sorrow. No anger was there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness, what a God we serve, pierced his heart like an arrow. We need to spend more time with Jesus, folks. It was not long after this encounter that Peter found his way back to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was overcome by drowsiness along with the other two disciples earlier. Now he needed to go back to draw up those memories of the battle Jesus had to fight there. If you read the description of that, Jesus almost died there if it hadn't been for the angel stepping in. Satan and his crew was all around him. All he could see was darkness. He couldn't see any further. You know, folks, like Peter, we too need to spend time in the garden remembering what was done there for each one of us. Like Peter, we've all fallen short, but we have a Savior who loves us immensely. To avoid ending up like Lot's wife, we each need to spend time every day in the garden and near the cross. May our anchor hold, Lord, and grip you Jesus Christ, our solid rock, amen.